you all very much for being here today. KCDC is kind of like my hometown conference. Uh, named Zach Gardner. Zach the Snack is what they call me. I always tend to bring snacks wherever I go. I'm the chief architect at, anyone want to guess where I work at? Keyhole Software. All right, you said it once. Show of hands. How many of you all have heard of Keyhole Software before? Good. Very good. We're based in beautiful Lenexa, Kansas, right near Zarda Barbecue. For those that are from Kansas City, we all know that we give directions in terms of cultural landmarks for where your nearest barbecue station is at. I do, as a chief architect, I do pretty much about everything. Any statement of work that comes across our desks, I normally have a hand in, new clients. I think I have five clients. I think I'm going to add in a sixth one as of today that I deal with. So I keep, I keep busy. I also have a LinkedIn presence. You know, if y'all are LinkedIn followers, if you like GIFs, which is the correct way, by the way that it is pronounced, follow me because I have good GIFs. I also do good videos too. And hello, everyone that I am eventually going to be streaming this to. We do just a little bit about everything. Um, we started doing training for COBOL developers. I mean, who, who still does COBOL? Don't raise your hands. You probably shouldn't admit it. Actually, you should because you get paid like bank if you do COBOL. We train them how to do Java and we just kind of evolve the practice out of that. We go when we help and we train and we educate. And unlike most consulting firms, we are antithetical to land and expand. I would not want to do a business with a company that does that. No shade on anyone if that's your business model. You know, it's, it's your choice. This is a no judge zone, but uh, it's just, just not how I do it. So um, I like to, as you can tell from the video of parkour, from the audio, I like to do things a little differently. You know, this is kind of the afternoon. So let's, you know, let's kind of loosen up a little bit. I want to tell a little bit of the story first, because you've never been to a KC presentation before where they started it with a story. So there's a story of a man called Ali Hafid. And this has nothing to do with mono repos, by the way. So this will not be on the test at the end. But in the Middle East, uh, 1800s, if I remember right, there was a farmer named Ali Hafid. He was ostensibly a very happy man. He had a giant farm. He had orchards. He had just waving fields of wheat, but he was very unhappy until one day a Buddhist priest came by because, you know, all, all Buddhist priests typically do come by just, you know, in the very beginning of the story. And Ali Hafi confided in him that he had always heard about diamonds. He had everything in his life. He had, he had uh, wives, he had children, he had goats, he had land, but he did not have diamonds. He always wanted diamonds. So the Buddhist priest was like, all right, Ali Hafid, if you want diamonds, go find a river that runs between two beaches of white sand that are between two blue mountains. So Ali Hafid sold everything that he owned. He traveled from Mesopotamia, you know, kind of the Iraq, uh, Lebanon area. He traveled through Israel. He traveled through Rome. He traveled through everywhere that he could, going west and west and west. And he could not find a river that ran between two beaches with white sand in between two blue mountains. Eventually, he got to the Rock of Gibraltar, which if you're picturing it, it's the farthest, pretty much the farthest west you can go, farthest south you can go in Europe. And he, at that time, he just, his hair was bleached, his, his skin was just emaciated, he hadn't eaten very well, he clothes, he barely had anything on, he was in rags. And he threw himself into the waters around the Rock of Gibraltar, just completely defeated. But back at home, his neighbor, whom he had sold his land to, decided one day just to go out and get a shovel. Maybe he got it from Walmart next to his, his big ass fan. And he decided to dig, you know, a hole no deeper than a child would dig. And you know what he found? Sure y'all can probably guess. He found some diamonds. That is to say that when you go home today, give your spouse a hug, give your kids a hug. The only things you truly need in life are the things that you already have. And with that, we're going to talk about mono repos. So, excellent transition, by the way. That's what I'm famous for. So, raise your hands if you can empathize with these statements. You started working on a project. Things were really, really fast. You know, you had a single file in there. And then when it compiled, it was like presto blamo. But over time, the business, they asked for features. Because businesses always ask for features. And then they changed their minds. Because businesses always change their minds. That's fine. 
that's what we are. And over time, it got slower and slower and slower to the point where you're like, oh, well, there's just a, there's just a technical debt. You know, you just, you just throw out some words. You're like, oh, we can't work on this feature. It's going to take too long. Raise your hands. That ever sounds like a conversation you've been in. Anyone that's not raising your hands, you're either lying or you haven't been in this business long enough, which either one is fine. That is the context. That is the problem that we're going to seek to solve with mono repos. How can we organically add features to an application without slowing it down, but also being able to slice and dice it so that the developers that come after us, may they rest in peace. May they have a better job than what we did. Now, context is very important, as any architect will tell you. The problem that we're trying to solve is not a problem that every business has. If you are a startup and you have a landing page and you have two features in your entire application, or if you're an individual contributor, if you're doing a side project for fun, maybe you're trying to visualize the blockchain and it's just you, only you, and just you, you probably don't need mono repos because you're gonna be the only developer committing to it there's not a team, there's not a bunch of disparate features that all need to share code. So just, just keep that in mind. Just because Netflix does it, doesn't mean you have to do it. So what, what is a mono repo? Has anyone else, uh, anyone heard of mono repos for this presentation? Awesome, awesome. The first time that I was actually exposed to them was with Google. For some reason, I decided to learn how Google structured their source code because I like to learn as an architect from the successes and, I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of schadenfreude, their failures because I don't want my clients to experience those same failures. So I looked at Google as kind of like the penultimate example of what could be out there. Did you all know that Google only has two Git repositories? I mean, think about it. You have Google Reader, you have Gmail, you have all the other features that Google has killed over the years that everyone loves that you know, are, are in some repository somewhere. They have two repos. One of them is YouTube and one of them is everything else. And I think if YouTube would have started being developed at Google, they probably would only have one Git repo. I just think logistically they couldn't include it in. And they do that for a couple reasons. When you're at that kind of a scale, you do need a really holistic view of your entire code base. Sometimes you just wanna press control F and be able to find all the references to everything. It is a little difficult at their scale and they do some crazy things, but the fact that they have all of their features in one Git repository, they have a clean code history. If a new developer starts, guess what? They gotta check out one code base. It makes it very simple. And that's sort of the extreme. I wouldn't recommend you go that way. Most of us aren't Google. I don't see any Googlers in the audience. Apologies. Uh, I'm not throwing shade on your company at all. But you all did almost kill Flutter, which kind of worries me. So most of us are kind of in between the, the individual contributor and the Google. We have teams of people. We have people that need to work together. Sometimes we have, you know, disagreements with each other. Sometimes we like to do things one way. Sometimes we like to do things the other way. But in general, this is specifically about JavaScript, mono repos. We're not talking about the ocean, we're talking about just our little pool. And if you went out, like me, and you're like, all right, I'm a JavaScript architect, what options do I have? You would find that there are a lot of options. I think this link that I had, I think it's like 30 different options. So how do you evaluate them without actually trying them all and seeing if they fail? Well. First, I like to do a little history. Like I said, I've been a developer for a very, very long time. Anyone remember Bauer back in the day? Hell yeah, I remember Bauer. Before that, we were stitching together JavaScript files just with PHP or with any other language or, uh, oh God, what was that thing in uh, MVC? The Bundler, yeah, I remember the Bundler. I still use the Bundler to this day on one of my applications which was good. I mean, Bauer got us a little bit. And then we had Browserify, which that was awesome because you could bring in node libraries and use them in your web applications, which was like, holy cow, I never could have imagined that. But times have changed. So the first thing I'd recommend you do is plug in your old favorites. And then when someone says, oh, 
here are 15 different libraries that you could use. You probably want to avoid the ones that were created by someone in their basement or their mom's basement, or even worse, their grandma's basement. And you want to find something that is actually widely used by a number of people. Depending upon, and this, this trick actually works for almost anything that has a centralized dependency management system, you go and you plug in all of the different options. So from here, there's BVM, there's Bolt, there's OAO. How would you pronounce it? Oh, wow. Oh, I don't know. It might just be OAO. Not the best name, by the way. You're learning a lot of business tricks here. But then NX and Turbo. So as you can clearly tell from this beautiful diagram, NX, Lerna, and Turbo are the three that used to be most widely used prior to 2023. I think I pulled this in like uh, December, uh, October, sometime last year. But Turbo, interestingly enough, is now above Lerna. And I'll get into that for a second. So anyone want to guess what this dip is? Does anyone know? I'm going to buy the dip. I'm going to buy the Bitcoin. Who wants to guess what this dip is? Christmas. Christmas. Because even developers have to celebrate the birth of our Lord, you know? And I think this, uh, I think this one might be Christmas or it might be Thanksgiving. Or NPMJS went down, which, you know, that happens, you know, from time to time. So we took our list. I had uh, 30 candidates. I was like, okay, I'm only going to want to use the ones that other people are already using. Because if they weren't using it, then they would be missing out. If they are using it, there's probably a good reason. Why they're, mess why they're using it, right? Not to say if your friends are jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, mileage may vary. If some of my friends were jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge, I would be like, oh, that's just because they're crazy. But others, I, would, I don't know, I might give a second thought to jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge. So these are sort of three candidates, NX, Lerna, and Turbo. But I will, however, call out one option that I ran into a long, long time ago. And that's NPM workspaces. If you're using, I mean, there are other options that you could be using other than NPM. You could be a hipster. You could be using Yarn. I think that's what the kids are using these days. I'm too old to learn those kind of things, honestly. I'm, you know, uh, I can run for president. I'll tell you that much. That's how old I am. But I like using things that I've known for a long time. NPM actually has the ability in a package JSON to do what are called NPM workspaces, which if you think about it, if you have a large code base, uh, the guy before me did a presentation on pizzas. So maybe you have a feature for ordering pizzas, a feature for the inventory of pizzas, maybe you have a point of sale system. Those are all separate features. Instead of having them just kind of colluded together in some like crazy mess, maybe it'd be nice if you had folders where you had one folder for inventory, you had one folder for orders, you had another order for a uh, folder for point of sale. That's what NPM Workspaces lets you do. It lets you specify at the package JSON level the name of your project, and then you get to list out all the workspaces. Having a packages folder slash feature A, feature B, feature C, by convention. I mean, you could just as easily call this like uh, Jerry's Garage or something, or Bob's Your Uncle. Like, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is that you put it in that array. And then when you go and you look at your structure of your root directory, there's a package JSON at the root level, which defines all your workspaces. Then inside there, there's feature A, which could be inventory, and that has its own package JSON. Because when you think about it, some features across your application hopefully use the same style guide. They hopefully use the same common components, but you know, this hasn't happened, I'm sure this hasn't happened to any of you all, but maybe one team that works in your application wants to do things a completely different way. You know, maybe you are that team. Again, this presentation, this is a no judge zone. So what you can do is you can have individual features that are able to specify, well, maybe at the root level I'm using, I don't know, material UI, what are they up to, six? But I'm a hipster, you know, I have a Mac. I'm a Mac guy now. Uh, maybe I want to use Material Design 7, or maybe I want to use Material Design 8 Beta 15 or something like that. That's okay, because with monorepos, the idea is that you can have experimentation 
This is like college inside here, which I have a nine and a six year old. I'm not going to tell them that, by the way, you know, can't do anything in college. But you can have experiments inside of here where each feature can effectively be independent of all of the other ones. And it allows you to either share those dependencies or keep those dependencies to yourself, kind of like what happens in Vegas. So when you go to actually run your NPM workspace, what it does is it says, OK, I have five workspaces. I'm going to compile each of them separately. And in my node modules folder up at the root, I'm going to create a symbolic link. I think it's a symbolic. I don't think it's a hard link um, to that particular output of that package. So maybe you have a common library. Maybe you have a library where you specify all your common components. A library would specify your styles, your images, you know, your, your what have yous. Instead of having to replicate that code everywhere, you can just have one workspace reference the node module up at the top, and then magically you get all those dependencies. So you have one place where you manage common components, but every other place gets to use it. Now, this is very important. The only things you should share are the things that you would be okay with your grandma seeing. What you don't want to do is to have a feature for inventory that has one really cool component, and then you're like, oh, well, I kind of want to reuse that in point of sale. It's the same thing that we do on the API side. You don't want to share things that have business functionality, business specificity to them. What you want to share are things that are independent of use case. You want to share logging. You want to share text fields. You want to share form fields. But there shouldn't be, unless it's a very specific use case, there really shouldn't be something that you're sharing from one to another, one business feature to another. You really should only try to limit yourself to sharing things that are truly in like a, a common or a core or a, a shared library. I don't know how many applications I've been on that have like a share or like a common or a core. So this is how you build it. Pretty simple. So, and that's what I liked about it, honestly. It was all native to NPM. I was already using it. It was widely documented, it was widely understood, but it did have some limitations in terms of not being super smart. And what I mean by that is, if I only changed feature B, whenever I went to go build it on my CACD, it rebuilt the whole thing, which was like, well, NPM workspaces, this was one of the problems I was trying to avoid. If I had a large application and I only changed the text on one thing, I don't have to rebuild the whole application. I want to have it smart enough so that it only needs to build the things that I have actually changed. Because as you get to a larger and larger and larger ecosystem, that's really what it's going to take time. That's the thing that slows you down. Anything that gets between you and testing something in your dev environment should be obliterated. And so this one just did not cut it for me, unfortunately. So I looked at my other options. NX was the one that I'm pretty sure won out. So. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. And I liked it for a lot of reasons. It has a ton of plugins, which is good because, you know, I kind of like things work out of the box, but I also want to be able to change things as I go along. It was like incredibly fast. I'm not talking, uh, God, what was that thing that came out last year? Bun JS, which, uh, is anyone actually using Bun? Okay, good. I, I throw a lot of shade at Bun, so I'm. Good. I want to make sure I wasn't offending anyone. And, and NX is more than just a mono repo. Um, credit to them. I did not come up with this beautiful artwork. Um, the good Lord decided to bless me with certain talents, but artwork was not among them. NX is like a whole ecosystem that you can use. You can use it for distributed tax execution. It integrates with uh, Cypress and Playwright. You can do code generation, task running. You could do like a whole host of stuff with it. The part that I wanted to focus on was specifically what can I do to create mono repos? Ton of stuff. You can do automatic code migration. I mean, you know, pretty much the only thing it doesn't do is, you know, slice bread. So if you want to, if you want to go and explore the NX world, this is what you're going to go through. And there's a two or three slides. I have a little bit of a choice, a little bit of a, was that Goosebumps, where you get to choose your own adventure? 
Hell yeah. I'm date I love when I date myself with certain references. So I want to, my application, it's going to be the, the most widely used node package ever. It's going to return true when a number is even. Maybe it returns null when a number is not even. I don't know, because that would be, it would be too simple to return false. So I'm like, okay, NX, I want to be able to generate a library. You can think of a library kind of like a feature in a package. I want you to go in this libs folder, and I want you to be able to make it publishable. So you do that, and you get somewhat of a similar project structure to what I was showing with NPM workspaces, where you still have like a root level, and then you have your packages, and here's my even. There's a whole bunch of stuff. It has TypeScript support, so I don't know if we're going to be TypeScript stands in the room. Um, that's fine. You know, live your best life. That's fine. No biggie. Uh, but you still have the ability to have a package JSON within your project that lets you decide when and how and what you want to use. So it's like, okay, it was pretty easy. You know, I didn't have to dive all the way in, but I got a little bit farther. Now, the very first one, one of the other options that I included was Lerna, which has an incredible logo. I mean, I think that's the Hydra, if my Greek mythology is right. If nothing else, you should use the library because it has a good logo. We used it in production for probably about two years, and uh, don't use it. Okay, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, Vercel, of course, because you know it's Vercel, they have everything. They have their own mono repo called Turbo Repo. It was written in Rust, it's blazing fast. So I was like, okay, it's probably down to NX and Turbo Repo, you know, battle of the century. Again, creating it is, again, very, very simple. You specify what you want to do. You say, oh, I want to do a TypeScript with Next.js. I want to, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, my typing. Uh, I'm going to do my linting, like all that stuff. It walks you through it. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, kind of like, um, oh, God, what was that tool, Yeoman, that we used to use back in the day? Yeah, hell yeah, Yeoman. Uh, I still, it's still around. I still randomly run into it. Again, Turbo Repo, you can do a bunch of other things. It's definitely the biggest competitor with NX, but uh, uh, I was in between. I was kind of 50 50. So I was like, okay, internet, tell me what are the things that I'm not thinking about? Because I could create them quickly, I could understand how I was going to use it. And there were two articles that kind of swayed my opinion. Turbo, they said, was good for teams that are a little bit smaller, NX was for teams that are a little bit larger. I like to do most of our clients are rather large. So I was like, okay, NX, sure, let's do this. The first thing that I ran into when I was using NX is I had to make a decision. And architects good at a lot of things. Decisions usually are not one of them. There's two options that you have for how you're going to share your code, how you're going to structure all of your individual packages. One option is that you can go the package route where there's uh, each package can have its own package JSON, different versions of different dependencies, kind of the model that I was talking about before. Integrated, there's not the opportunity, there's not as much an opportunity to be able to decide your own destiny. You have to use what everyone else is using. And there are pros, don't get me wrong, and there are cons to doing either way. If you go with a package based approach, I would say that's good for teams that are just very, very loosely coupled. Like they maybe live in different continents or like, I don't know, they're Canadian or something. Like they're just, they're different than the rest of us. Integrated is nothing by, I love Canada, by the way. Uh, you know, I was there last year. It was an awesome place. Integrated, you have to always use the same version of the same dependencies, which when you want to upgrade things, it makes it a little bit more difficult because you have to go through every single package before you can actually execute the upgrade. So there are pros and there are cons. We tried package-based, the equivalent of it in Lerna back in the day when we did our first deployment. And uh, it was three of us. And like, you know, not to toot my own horn, but like, I kind of know what I'm doing. And even then it was really difficult we just ran into just so many different issues. We had, uh, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a large application in production using multiple versions of React, things are gonna get a little weird. And you're also gonna bog down the client with having to download all those different versions of React. 
simply because you couldn't be bothered to be able to upgrade everything to work on one version, which, you know, it might be fine, you know, to each their own. So integrated was the way we went. We were like, we can still have our code split up. We can still share common code, not business functions, but common code. And we have the ability to only tell our CICD, C, CICD system, only build the things that I have actually changed in this commit. So I went a little bit farther. I actually went through the full setup process. You can look at these beautiful slides or you can continue to look at me, you know, which, whichever you prefer. Uh, it really wasn't that bad. Um, my actually uh, recommendation to you all, if you're creating a demo project, make it a little bit more simple than just is even. I honestly don't think that's like a good use of anyone's time to really understand like what it's gonna be. So I like to do keyhole software automotive shop because automotive software is actually quite compelling. You have an inventory, you have financing, you have servicing. Those are sort of loosely coupled business units. They have some shared lingua franca in terms of the VIN number, but they have discrete functions. They have things that they share. So I really like to go through, like, I like to pretend that I work at like an automotive shop um, because, you know, we all do things virtually. We don't really do things with our hands. You know, it's, we, we don't do fake work, I, don't, I wouldn't say, but, you know, sometimes I like to do things with my hands. So this is the structure of the root. It spun up all this stuff for me. You'll notice that, of course, we have our package JSON at the root level. If I dive in and I want to create a new feature inside of there, I say, okay, NX, generate me a library. We're going to create the inventory library, which would be like, if you go to your dealer's website, these are all the cars that they have in their inventory. Uh, what test runner would I like to use? Just, I don't know. I don't write unit tests. Don't tell my boss that. Um, oh, this is being recorded. Awesome. Um, what bundler would you like to use? Vite? Sure. Again, don't really care. More important things to do. This is the structure of the package that it generates for you. So you still got your libs, you got your auto inventory. Again, you could have called this Bob's your uncle or Zach says funny things. Either of them told you would have worked. It created my Vite config. Like it did a lot of stuff, honestly, for me. And when you get down to it, like it's kind of like the wedding, you know, like you, you do a lot of planning for a wedding. You get a lot of things ready for the wedding. And then when the wedding is over, it's like, oh, like, OK, what do we do now? I don't know. So this is really what we mean when we say like a, a mono repo. Like this is a feature to where this is like the best feature I've ever written. It's a function that returns a string. Now, of course, you're gonna do something more complicated than that. Anything that you do inside this lib folder right here represents a feature in your mono repo. So I could have built out a single page application that has lists of all the different beautiful cars that we offer. I am personally a fan of the DeLorean. I think when I retire, uh, I'm going to get a DeLorean. Maybe it's just a listing of all the DeLoreans that you have. And then when we have additional features, like everything is housed inside this lib folder. There is this package JSON right here, but it's kind of like the appendix. You know, it's mostly for looks. Everything that it really inherits is the package JSON all the way down at the root. When I want to build it, it knew this was the name of my feature. I told it to go build. It went through, used Vite. I don't know. I don't know what Vite does. Uh, I do know what Vite does. But it created the single JavaScript file based on my awesome function, which had zero dependencies and like presto blamo. I had a feature that was independently deployable. NX was smart enough and it knew that when I wanted to do a change on my CACD system to only build that particular feature, it knew to reuse everything. Yes, from Mr. Cloud Copilot. Yeah, so under the covers, if I remember right, what it does, it tags on the package JSON level when it does a build. And then when you're doing your CI CD pipeline, especially like if you're using Git, it, like, it makes it so much easier, but it'll be like, okay, there's no changes that ever happened since the last time I ran this in this particular package. So I know I don't have to go and do anything to it. So when you're here, you're just pulling it down 
Mm -hmm. In your peer package locally, when you're developing it, you would actually be pulling it down through a symbolic link. So there would be like a sim link at wherever the node modules level is when you're just doing it locally. But yes, when you're, yep, on the CICD side, when you actually define here are all my dependencies, it gives you the ability to say like, this is the version that I'm using. So when you go and do the NX build, there's also an NX publish where that would send it up to your NPM repository. Ideally a private NPM repository, which Synopia, awesome, remember that one. And then when you're compiling it, you're getting all your static content ready, you're about to put it in the Docker package, Docker image, it pulls it down from your NPM registry and it's based on the latest version that was deployed, which if you only made a commit in one folder, why do you have to rebuild the whole thing? You don't. So excellent question. Any other questions, by the way? I talk, I talk kind of quickly. Always wait for a few seconds before you ask. So, yeah, absolutely. Hmm? Yeah. I think if you're if you're already drinking the Vercel Kool Aid, um, which you know, teach their own, that's fine. There's no reason not to go with Turbo. But if you're in a much more heterogeneous ecosystem or you like to, you know, kind of pick and choose what you want to use, most people are probably going to go with NX, which, I mean, we might have like one client that's using Vercel. Um, just, you know, it's kind of the anecdotally to, you know, the things that I've worked on and the things that I had most experience in. But good question. So I, I assume it probably does at some point, you know, it's all JavaScript anyway. So I want to create my second feature, which is financing, because I want to be able to not have to front the entire cost of my DeLorean when I do buy it. And then we get to the fun part. So in the TypeScript config, it automatically added this in for me. It automatically says when I want to have a dependency where I'm bringing in something from Keyhole Auto Finance or Keyhole Auto Inventory, which you shouldn't do. You should only do it if it's truly common code. But if there was some sort of weird existential crisis where I did have to bring something in, when I'm doing my import statement, this is how TypeScript would know, these are all the different types. So I kind of like that. I mean, I, I really honestly didn't have to do much of anything when I set this up. I just kind of dug in because I wanted to understand how it works. And then I created in my auto financing, I pulled in my dependency from auto inventory, which you should not do. I'm just doing this just to show how it works. And then my auto financing function calls my auto inventory function. And it says my inventory now has financing 2024. Awesome. It's been a pretty good year so far. So from that, I'd already been working with Lerna for like two years. I was like, okay. This gave me everything I wanted. It was a hell of a lot faster than Lerna was. Lerna actually, I think, uses NX under the covers, if I remember right, and they were bought by NX. It let me split everything up. It had TypeScript support. There really wasn't anything that I could find that I didn't like about it. And if, you're, if you want to kind of walk through, these are the, the two best tutorials that I ran through, which React documentation is like, Primo, NX is pretty close. It was pretty good. Not as good as Microsoft's, you know. If you, if you ever have insomnia, read a Microsoft documentation. But this one, these two are pretty good. And especially because I was already in React land. Um, I'm not, a, not an Angular guy. So if I had to do it all over again, I would have definitely gone not with Lerna, but with NX. I mean, it was just, it was so fast. It was so easy to use. I like the fact that I can have an integrated dependency to where my developers, I tell them not to use different versions of things. They don't listen to me, but if I have it in the package JSON and it's integrated, they have to do it because there's no other way for them not to do it. I really like that. And honestly, it helps with the velocity of the team overall. If people aren't using different versions of different libraries and it helps with performance for the user, which, I mean, if we're not doing something because it's good for the user, like, you know, we might as well go home. Uh, it gave me, uh, onboarding was really easy. A lot of people are getting more and more familiar with this. This is getting something to be more and more common. And there really wasn't any reason for me not to use it unless I was doing it just on a 
personal fun project. You know, this, this again is a very, very, very specific use case. You shouldn't use something just because Google does it. You shouldn't use something because Facebook does it. You should do it because it makes sense. So if you have a large team all working on different features on a large code base and you want to, you could theoretically retrofit this into an existing application, 10 times easier to do if it's Greenfield. But if you have an opportunity to, I would definitely say consider this. Do it. Do your due diligence. You know, I'm not a. I, this is not financial advice. You know, I, not a financial advisor, as they say. But out of all your options, I would be surprised unless you're like Lerna guy over here. You know, Mr. Lerna sitting over there. You know, if you're not if you're not using Lerna, uh, not using Vercel, excuse me, then you know you're, you're probably going to go with NX at some point or another. So um, that's my story. We've had some laughs. We've shed some tears. I have misspoke more than likely a few times. Thank you all for listening to me ramble. I truly enjoy getting in front of a group of people and making a fool of myself. So thank you for giving me that opportunity.